Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ask the Voice of Authority, brought to you by Carter Jonas, GLE and London Square Partners. My name is Toby Fox. I'm the Managing Director at 3Fox, the marketing agency for councils. Our job is to keep our network of councils and developers uh, and investors and their influencers and advisors connected. And one of the ways that we do that is by interviewing public sector leaders and senior officers uh, to give our network a deeper understanding of the vision for a place and how it will grow and evolve by hearing from the people shaping that vision and what makes them tick. You can find an archive of over 350 written and recorded interviews at thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. Now, the format of our live interviews is simple. We ask Voice of Authority seven questions. The first three will cover their wish list and the challenges that they must overcome to deliver that list uh, and the partners that they're seeking to help them with it. And then we'll ask our Voice of Authority what constitutes good development and who or what has shaped their views on growth and the watershed moments in their life and career that have led them to our screens today. And finally, we'll ask what they get up to outside of work. What are the interests and passions that drive and motivate them and perhaps shape those views and ambitions? And for the last fortnight, we've been inviting questions from viewers through Twitter and LinkedIn. And we've got some questions from the audience that we'll be putting to our voice of authority during the session today as well. And we're delighted that today those questions will be put to the Corporate Director of Regeneration and Culture at Redbridge Council, Mark Bajant. And it's tricky to think of a London borough that hasn't benefited from Mark's considered approach to housing, estate renewal and enabling development since his nine years at Kensington and Chelsea in the 1990s. Uh, along with interim roles at Greenwich and Haringey and Tower Hamlets and Sutton and Lewisham Homes, Bajant has advised Hackney and Islington and Kingston and the City of London, as well as several boroughs outside the capital. And in that time, he's become something of a figurehead for direct delivery, uh, creating many local housing companies and the multi-borough place scheme to deploy modern methods of construction in house building uh, and publishing with Three Fox two editions of the indispensable guide, how to set up a local housing company, as well as being on the judging panel for the direct delivery awards. Mark, I'm nearly out of breath. Welcome. You're at uh, Redbridge now. Uh, what are the three things that top your wish list uh, at the borough? Morning, Toby, and, and thanks for inviting me on. Uh, it's, it's really hard to narrow it down to three things, so I'm probably going to break all the rules from, from the start and, and cheat a bit. So, I mean, the baseline of what I need to deliver on the housing front in Redbridge is the council's ha ha council housing programme. There's an HRA programme with 600 homes in, in development. We've got 150 odd on site at the moment. And then there's a very ambitious programme of general funded uh, mixed tenure development. So we're doing another 600 homes across a range of sites, which will be some affordable and some for sale, which is a, it's a big step for a, a council like Redbridge to move into the for sale market. Um, so so that, those, those are the two kind of bedrocks of, of delivery that need to happen. And obviously a lot of, a lot of uh, expenditure going into that. But those aren't my top three things, <laughs> so I'm cheating. Um, the, the first one is Ilford Town Centre, um, uh, particularly the Western Gateway Scheme, which is uh, a proposed joint venture development in the centre of Ilford. Uh, this is linked to moving part of the, the gyratory system around Ilford. So, um, moving the, the Western Geratory, as it's known, and um, creating a new opportunity around the new Elizabeth Line station at Ilford. Uh, so this is, this is new homes, this is new business opportunity, this is new public realm space. If, if you've spent time in Ilford Town Centre, you'll know there isn't in, in the centre of town uh, much in the way of green space. So this is really bringing that opportunity into play. Uh, which is really important for local people. Um, there, there's also a whole civic and cultural quarter in the town centre that we're wanting to develop around the town hall and assets in that area. Uh, so that was number one. Uh, number two is our community hubs programme. So this is uh, all about integrating service delivery at the front line across a range of council and partner services. And it's about being community led. So this is where we're designing with community groups, with community panels, a series of community hubs that will be in walking distance. So that kind of 15, 20 minute uh, distance from, from anywhere in the borough where people live. This will involve a library, health facilities, 
in, in many of them small business uh, startup facilities and um, a range of other community facilities and services. Um, and it's not just about the buildings, obviously it's about how people work together, how the community is involved in managing those facilities and making best use of them, and how all the different council and health partner services are involved in delivering that. So that's a really exciting program, um, which again, those, those community hubs are linked in to the housing development side of things because we're taking the opportunity to build a hub on the, the ground or, or first two floors and then building homes above and on the, on the wider site where there's a bigger footprint. So that's number two. And number three, which is really important, is the, is the leisure offer, expanding the leisure offer and the cultural offer in the borough. Um, so this, this job is regeneration and culture and there's a very, very clear linkage there between growth in terms of town centres and economy uh, and what Redbridge has in so you know, vast amounts, which is green space and, and brilliant leisure space. So we've got the Hainault Forest, which uh, is right on the edge of the borough heading out into Essex. We've got the Fairlock Waters, uh, which is an, another a big kind of country park on, on the edge of, of the borough. We've got a development in Wanstead of a, of a new swimming pool as part of a refurbishment of the leisure centre there linked to the local school. And in Valentine's Park, we're going to build a new Lido. The old Valentine's Lido was demolished in, I think, 1995, 1996, something like that. And um, the, the leader of the council has made a, a strong commitment to bring back the Lido. Um, so that some really exciting projects. And there's a few more that are just twinkles in the eye at the moment, which I won't announce today. There's a few more leisure based things that we're exploring as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. That, that's an exciting programme. Um, I, I, just sort of referring back to your your um, history in in local government. Uh, uh, how much is the um, Redbridge build program itself how much of that was on the on the table when you came to the job and how much of it is the result of you taking the job you see I've only been there four months so I really can't take credit for for very much of this at all I think um you know there's there's been a huge amount of planning going on over the years to to put this program together um so I think I was I was brought in to to really drive delivery of this program and as I say, there are a few twinkles in the eye, things, things that are bubbling under where I, I'm certainly bringing in thinking and influence to build on what's already an ambitious programme. Um, and there is a risk with, with something like this to, to aim too high and try and do too much. So uh, I've got quite enough to be getting on with, but there's definitely things that I want to add to the mix. Um, and how, how much will modern methods of construction play a role in, in the development programme going forward, given, given what you and, and maybe you want to expand a little bit on, on what you did with PLACE? Sure. So for those who don't know, PLACE stands for the Pan London Accommodation Collaborative Enterprise, which is a, a bit of a mouthful. But it's basically a, a group of boroughs working together to deliver modular housing for temporary accommodation for homeless families. And this, the distinct thing about it is that those homes were designed so they can be moved from site to site. So if the home has a 40 year lifespan and uh, it, it's moved five times, you know, eight years on each site, actually that's four times, isn't it? But yeah, you know, you, you know what I mean. Um, so um, that, that's the concept. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I was really excited to be part of setting that up and uh, the procurement process to, to select that product, which I think was, was a, a really great process of partnership between boroughs and the GLA who were involved throughout uh, and funding that. Um, and it, as I say, it was a very specific product for a very specific purpose, but I think it also had um, every reason to be available for other uses as well. Just because we designed it so you could move it, doesn't mean you couldn't leave it permanently and at some point those units will will have a permanent home I'm, I'm sure of that because uh, they're, they're designed to last um, so I think bringing that thinking into the, the the way Redbridge will be delivering its housing program is absolutely in my in my head uh, I can't say at this point 
that I've suddenly turned the whole programme upside down to make that happen. I think that's something that needs very careful review and thought. And some of the schemes obviously are on site. Some of them are at very, a very far advanced design stage and it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be cost effective to, to revise those at this point. But just bringing that thinking and that awareness um, and that openness to, to those ways of working is absolutely critical, I think. Um, and you, if you look at what's happening with the, the funding from government through, through the GLA, through Homes England, it's all pointing in that direction. Uh, so it's absolutely something we need to be working on. There's lots of threads in what you've said that, that I'm going to um, pick up later. But just, just to wrap this section up, I, I wonder that that combination of um, on your wish list reflected the the job title, regeneration and, and culture. How much is a, a, of a leap is that for you, given that your focus on, on housing uh, in, in your previous career? Yeah, I mean, it really is a stretch for me into the whole area of libraries, leisure, culture. I, I've worked with colleagues in, in boroughs over the years in those areas, but I've, I've never run those services. I've never led on those. And um, yeah, so I mean, for me, that was part of the attraction of the job was to have that stretch beyond my roots in, in housing and regeneration, which is you know, much more familiar and comfortable territory. Um, and, and just the, the idea that rather than housing led regeneration, which was often the model in other places, this was much more about that balancing act between all of the wider environmental and leisure aspects with, with economic growth, uh, particularly on a, on a spatial dimension where if you look at the borough of Redbridge, those of you who aren't familiar with it, you know, the, the south of the borough along what we might call the crossrail corridor, you can see that's where there's already the, the more urban environment and, and scope for further intensification of development. And then if you go to the north of the borough, you've got much more of the green belt, the, the leisure space and so on. So how do we work with the local people, the local community to integrate those two different aspects so that the borough feels like a place for everybody in all its aspects? So that people living in those new homes built next to Ilford Station are also engaged with the leisure opportunities in Fairlop, in Hainault and so on. So that, to me, that's part of the most exciting part of the job is the kind of behaviour change and outlook aspect of it. This is internal behavioural change as well for, for the council itself. And you're talking about the, the community hubs, for example, that's real cross departmental thinking. How easy has it been for the council to, to adapt and evolve in, in, in that way to, 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 to work with you on, on those hubs? So, I mean, there's there's a program team for the hubs who are really leading that work I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take any credit for that they they've been working over the last two three years really to bring that way of working and that way of thinking into the council and um, yeah I mean it, it, in any local authority I think it's a challenge to get that way of working really embedded and so it's it's still a work in progress. I think we're still we're still getting to grips with that. Uh, but it is having an impact across the council. And um, you know, for example, in the planning service, so the the planning team just won a MJ award, um, best best service of the year. So not just best planning team, but best council service of the year, which is pretty amazing. Again, I'm not yeah, taking absolutely. any credit for that. It's nice to walk in into an award ceremony um, without having had to do it. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that is all about how the planning team engage with the community. They, they call it planning for everyone. And, uh, you know, it's fantastic to see how, uh, for example, using Neighbourhood SIL to do crowdfunding of local community projects um, that are, you know, obviously linked to local development uh, is re really exciting stuff. Yeah, great stuff. Um, it's probably a good point to segue into the into the challenges that you face in delivering that that wish list. And we got a question in from Stuart Bailey at Night Frank around um, increasing build costs and ever increasing scrutiny of height and fire safety and carbon footprint and so on. How do you see all of that, the sort of building pressure against development, um, impacting housing delivery and, and development and, and, and the delivery of your wish list? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing to say is all of the stuff around building safety uh, is absolutely welcome and absolutely vital. And of course, it costs more to, to, to have those safety measures properly dealt with. Of course, it costs more to have that regulation of that process uh, imposed. 
but you know it's not imposed in the way the way we we see it we welcome it it's absolutely vital and um you know all of those issues around standards and quality is absolutely what we need to be promoting uh, for me it's it's looking from the point of view of the, the, the customer, the, the end user. So our residents need to feel that their, uh, their homes are absolutely safe, that it's a healthy environment for them to live in, to bring their children up in and so on. And um, those mistakes of the past demonstrate, you know, that that hasn't always been the case, particularly in, in some of the social housing that was developed, you know, in the 60s and 70s. We need to, this next generation of new council homes that, that we're all engaged in building need to set a, a completely new standard of quality. Uh, so, so there's that to, to start with. The, the question was really about the cost pressure, I think, and the cost pressure is, is absolutely, um, in this moment, it's, it's the number one issue in, in this industry. Um, we're grappling with it, we're struggling with it. So Redbridge had uh, three schemes last year that were out to tender. The tenders came in and um, there was a discussion and uh, they decided not to go ahead. So this is before I'd arrived. They decided not to go ahead and award those contracts uh, because of the, the pricing. So. Um, They've been put back out to tender um, slightly different approach, uh, but no, no dumbing down of quality or, or any of that, but, but a different procurement approach, really seeking to get a different response from different players in the market. How, and, does, that uh, different, how does the approach differ, Mark? Is that a sort of risk sharing exercise? No, it's not like that. I mean, it's, it's much more, as I say, about finding those contractors who are if you like perfectly sized horses for courses, that's the, that's the kind of um, thinking, but we're wanting to find contractors who will deliver what we're wanting uh, comfortably. But, um, you know, frankly, some of these schemes are, are smaller schemes and the larger, the larger constructors are probably holding some additional costs that some of the smaller ones aren't, which for a smaller scheme, those, those overhead costs you know, do make a difference. Um, it's, it's a lot of it's to do with scale, I think. Um, but anyway, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and, and say that we've we've cracked the nut because we haven't had the, the next round of prices in yet. So you need to come back to me in about two months' time, and uh, either I'll be beaming or or the opposite. But um, we we're in the midst of that process, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really difficult times. Um, but we we believe that there are ways of working with the marketplace to get the the prices that work for both sides and uh, and we can continue delivering um but yeah as it stands we've got some schemes on site we've got some schemes we we deliberately didn't progress and we're waiting for a new price to come in okay Mark, i'm gonna if it's okay i'm gonna put two more challenges to you and then i'm gonna ask you if there are any others that you're you're facing um first challenge uh, from the elections in may I, I, did, did did the results of the election present in any way a, a, a sort of challenge to you in in delivering your wish list no not at all i mean in redbridge the uh, the labor group um gained seats uh so if if anything there's there's more certainty more stability uh, and from my point of view, I'm always attracted to working in a place where there's that level of political stability uh, because I want to get things done. I don't want to spend time negotiating and arguing. I just want to get get on and deliver something. So, so that is the attraction. And I think that is a really solid base for, for delivering this programme. OK, and my final question on, the, on this section was um, is around funding for social housing. You know, how, how does the, the funding available to support the delivery of social housing um, represent a challenge to, to your program? So, I mean, I think at the moment, the relationship with the GLA in London, with, with local authorities uh, delivering housing is in a really good place. And, um, you know, I think, um, of course, there are challenges. There's always challenges. This, this whole point about cost, you know, we'll always go back and say, well, can we have a bit more grant because the, the prices are going up. So there is that difficult um, negotiation. But in terms of where things were three, four years ago and where things are now, councils have demonstrated that we can deliver. Um, the GLA has put faith in councils, put money in, and the results are there to see. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think um, it's it's still early days, but it's it's a maturing program. And I think um, someone like Redbridge, who's you know still at quite the early stages of developing its its uh, house building capacity and expertise. Um, we've got a lot of confidence that the GLA are there to support us and to help us build that capacity. And, you know, we're, we're talking to them about further sites, about adding to our pipeline of development. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's going to continue going well. Fantastic. And any other challenges that, that, um, that sort of spring into your mind? I mean, the main one you already touched on, which is within, within an authority like Redbridge, um, you know, it's not just about building the project management capacity, which is which is really important, but it's about having capacity in finance, legal, procurement, all, all the different parts of um, the, the council team that support making this kind of delivery work. Um, I will just put a plug in. We are actually recruiting now for some project managers and senior project managers in our capital delivery team. So that's to do housing delivery and uh, the, the other things I was talking about, leisure and so on. So, um, yeah, anyone on the call who knows somebody, um, ch check it out. Look, look out for our advert. And that's a challenge in itself, isn't it? Recruitment is, 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 is a tough task these days. It is. It really what is. What makes you think you can get the right people? Well, I mean, obviously, having this platform is a big help, Toby. Thank you. Um, we, we, we have an exciting programme. We, uh, I believe, um, you know, are a place that's worth coming to work because of the, the outlook of the team, as I've described it. You know, it's exciting, it's ambitious, there's that political stability, there's a lot to deliver, there's a lot to get on with. Um, but yeah, we're competing with other, other boroughs. There's a, there's a lot of need for really good project managers, uh, experienced development staff. And, um, you know, as we all know, there's, there's not enough to go around. Um, it's, so it's, it's a challenge. Okay, let's talk about um, partnerships, uh, Mark. And, and I've got a, cu a couple of, uh, of questions on that, and I'm sure you've got some, some thoughts as well. My first question really is the sort of partnership between local authority and, and national government and, and how you see the support from government, the, your requirements in terms of support from government, and how you see that sort of relationship developing. Yeah, I think um, the, the issue is at the moment is all about levelling up, isn't it? And, and what that means and, and how that translates into behaviour between government and, and local authorities, particularly the London context. So, um, you know, we, we're looking at the, the next round of the levelling up fund. We look at the levels of uh, need in, in uh, the borough, particularly around Ilford. We look at uh, what we want to what we want to achieve to bring up the, the, the local population in terms of uh, dealing with po poverty, addressing inequality. Uh, we think we've got a really strong case for the government providing us with additional finance. But Redbridge Council you know, doesn't have a lot of core grant funding from government. It's, it's, it's a council that um, you know, is, is probably underfunded compared with its peers. So we, we'd certainly argue that. And um, so having that dialogue, winning that argument, if you want to put it that way, is, is another key challenge. And, um, you know, and, and putting Redbridge on the map. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, um, years ago when I, I heard the name Redbridge, I didn't have a clue where it was. I knew where Ilford was. Um, and over the years, I've, I've discovered things about Redbridge. But it's, you know, it's not one of the most well-known uh, boroughs we want to change that part of my role is as an ambassador to bring Redbridge into those conversations whether it's pan London conversations or national conversations with, with government so yeah I, I think um, it's uh, it's a time for London boroughs to work together really closely and I, so I want to make sure that Redbridge is firmly part of that to work with the GLA as well and to make sure that London is is really keeping those issues on the agenda with government and, and not allowing this levelling up agenda to somehow divert attention away. So, so that that response is sort of focuses on the, the, the public sector as, uh, as, as partners. Um, so I'd like to kind of split a question in, into two in, in a way. And given your track record in direct delivery, how much of your ambition, how much of the borough's ambition can be met through your own teams and your own companies? And what sort of role do you see the private sector playing? 
So, I mean, I immediately went to think about the RP sector as well when you said that, and obviously that they're, they're not really private sector, they're somewhere in between. Um, but um, I mean, for me, the, the issue in, in a place like Redbridge is, are the, um, the private developers and the housing association of RP developers really paying attention to the opportunities in this area? Uh, and that again is part of my job is to promote those opportunities, to, to promote awareness. Um, you know, I've talked about us doing a you know, 1200 home development program over the next four years. Um, that's probably bigger than a number of other boroughs. It's certainly bigger than a number of RPs. It's certainly bigger than any of the RPs are doing individually in, in the borough of Redbridge. So there's a really important role for us to promote what is possible locally to those partners. Uh, on the private sector specifically, so um, there's obviously the role of the council in attracting partners to come and develop in the borough. So it's about making sure those opportunities are promoted. Uh, but there's a specific role in terms of joint venture partnership. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Ilford Western Gateway is all about us selecting a partner to work with on a joint venture basis. And I mean, that again, that process has been underway for the last uh, year or so before I arrived. And we're getting close to the point where we want to uh, announce a partner and then and then get into a joint venture agreement with them so that that's coming soon um, and there may well be other opportunities like that the council actually has a fair few land holdings which um, probably on its own it wouldn't have the capacity uh, to develop out it would want to work with a partner so you know again some of those twinkle in the eye moments are things that we're looking at now and saying well how might we uh, deliver that upcoming site is is it simply a site we would dispose of or would we rather work with a partner to develop it together and certainly my personal objective would be to always look at retaining the council's involvement where it makes sense to do so uh, rather than simply selling a, a site and then you know it's a one-way street there's, there's there's no turning back at that point Whereas if you work with a partner, who knows what you can you can get to together in order to deliver what the partner wants and what the council wants. We should take the chance to do our own plug that you know, you'll be at Site Match on the 8th of September and some of those kind of really early um, art of the possible conversations will be taking pl place there. So uh, developers, if you're watching, um, do come along on the 8th of September. Um, get into the, uh, if you use the chat to let us know who you are, we'll, we'll send you all the information you need. Um, I guess there's a question in there in, that, that sprang into my mind in all of that, Mark, which was around the sort of change to planning regulation and 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 sort of government approach to um, to development and to local authorities developing as well. What what are your views on on how that's shaping up? I mean, the the proposals are still really, I think, opaque and unclear. Um, so, for example, all of the questions around Section One Hundred Six being um, you know, ended and, and the, 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 new, uh, the new levy that comes in or, or whatever it's going to be called. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the detail of that um, we, we still need to see. Um, anything that speeds up and simplifies the process uh, could be good if that, if that supports good development. If it dumbs down, if it avoids uh, issues around um, you know, things like social value and, and negotiating the, the benefits for the local community, uh, if those things become just, just clumsy and, and hard, hard to work with, then uh, I wouldn't be in favour. So it, it really depends how the process works and what it delivers. That's fundamentally what, what it comes down to, I think. And, and it's too soon to say how that is going to work. I think that's a really good moment to move on to what you consider to be an, examples of good development. I was, I was thinking back to the days uh, I was working in Greenwich. I was, I was actually in Greenwich for, for 12 years. Um, and um, so something like the, the Kidbrook uh, village development in Greenwich, which was a you know, huge transformation of, over a long period of time of what had been really the, the most difficult um, estate, council estate in, in the borough. Um, 
just being part of that whole process was was fantastic seeing uh how the council was able to work with with its partner that was Barclay Homes of course uh to to bring that into play to 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 make it a reality and and then you know finish through on it you know really really follow through on it um I think that was that was a really good example um I think on a much smaller scale when we set up in Greenwich the first council house building program for 20 years was just such an achievement and um you know we did that back in 2009-10 um basically keeping it simple keeping it really basic so we we knew what we needed we needed four and five bedroom houses um we we had small sites we uh we quickly came up with designs uh that worked and we built those those homes and um yeah i i hope they've stood the test of time it was certainly at the time um such such a big achievement uh and and so welcomed by the community uh, and of course by the politicians so um yeah i think that would be another example um the, I just, uh, can I just drill into that a bit, Mark, before yeah. you move on? So the, you mentioned Kidbrook, and, and it seems to me really appropriate. We're, we're just approaching the um, memorial service um, in, in a few days to Tony Pidgeley. And just to mm. sort of mark a respect to the work that he achieved in, in his uh, too short lifetime. And that really is an astonishing record. And Kidbrook is the, is the crown jewel in that. Um, and then um, secondly, just to understand, when you were setting up that housing delivery programme in Greenwich, what was the state of the market at that point? Point. I mean, how many other local authorities could you look to for, for examples of how to, to go about that? How, how much of a pioneer was Greenwich at that time? Yeah, I mean, there wasn't really anything happening uh, in terms of local authority delivery. So, so if, you, if you go back to the, the late 90s and the early noughties, really, there was very, very little going on. Um, so that there, there weren't particular trailblazers that we could look to. Uh, we were much more looking to uh, RP partners to to get the ideas and 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 in fact the staff. So we 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 employed somebody who who come from an RP development team to to kickstart that team. Um, but the I mean the key thing was uh, councils had been lobbying for some time to get grant into developing council housing, and it was Alistair Darling, who's the uh, chancellor in two thousand nine, who announced it. Um, and we we knew that it was we knew that it was likely to be announced. So we had geared up. We'd selected our sites, and we had our architect in place. And we basically got into planning um, very very quickly after the announcement. So we were probably one of the first councils to start on site under that program. We we, we moved very very quickly. As I say, we we knew what we wanted to do. We didn't have a long debate about it. We selected a handful of sites we had the product we wanted to go with we went through a very rapid procurement process got it through planning and got onto site um has so it that, stood the the test of time i believe it has um yeah i mean i i still live in greenwich and i and whenever i'm walking around and, and i notice one of those um those houses we built back then it was uh feels moved pride anyway it's a great test. And, and, and going back to, um, to Tony Pidgeley, uh, what, what does the success of Kidbrook tell you about the, the values that you look for in, in, in partners that, that you want to work with at, at Redbridge? What sort of lessons do you draw out from, for, in, in terms of joint venturing, in terms of working with, with the private sector? I mean, the, the key thing, this is probably going to be just all cliche, but the, the key thing is about listening and communicating between partners and having complementary uh, vision and values and, and bringing complementary uh, expertise and, and resources to the table. So, you know, in that case, the council was leading in terms of uh, working with the existing residents and community, in terms of bringing the land and, and enabling all of that to happen. And um, Barclay Homes were leading in terms of their expertise in designing and delivering really good quality homes and communities and places and um, you know it, it was a really strong partnership and uh, you know obviously there was also the, the Royal Arsenal uh, through the same partnership in the borough so you know there was that established dialogue there was a degree of trust and understanding based on years of of getting to know the partners 
uh, understanding how they operate and, and working with them. And of course there were rows, like there are in any partnership, in any relationship, but there were um, fundamentals that, that were strong and, that, and saw it through. How, how important is the sort of um, consistency of staffing in, in that kind of partnership? You know, the, the lack of churn in, in personnel involved, because it is about people's relationships, isn't it? More than corporate relationships. I think you're right. I think that's really important. So um, during that period, I mean, from the, the leader of the council down through in terms of um, senior officers and on the and, the, and on the Barclays side, as you talked about, Tony, and then uh, say John Anderson, who was who was the, the, the next lead person locally, you know, those relationships were very strong and, and long lasting. So I think that was really important. Um, and I think where you get a churn and a turnover, it makes it harder to to keep that going. So let's let's ask a bit about who um, has influenced your your views on development on on growth. Where 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 have you kind of where were you formed, Mark? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a good question, and and I, I was reflecting on you know the the journey I've taken. Um, so I think those. Uh, Starting off, though, those things really kicked off uh, when I was with Kensington and Chelsea. And um, so Terry Alifat was my boss um, and um, just her strategic kind of incisiveness was really important. I mean, Kensington and Chelsea, there, there weren't huge development opportunities. There wasn't an exciting high multi-million pound programme to run. Um, but the issues were really like it was all about those balancing issues between the the the, the community, very rich, very poor, mix uh, in very close proximity. Those issues around design, those issues around um, how how do you intensify sensitively within within an area that's got you know all that all that conservation heritage issues plus um, you know. All, all of the other things that, that people value about the area, and yet you want to deliver more homes. So re really great place to learn those principles, if you like, in a microcosm of, then I moved to Greenwich and it was on a massive scale, completely the, the opposite end, uh, Greenwich Peninsula, you know, 12, 14,000 homes to be master planned and delivered. Um, but having that same way of thinking and thinking strategically, thinking of those specific issues, on a big scale and then on an individual plot scale when you're dealing with a particular development uh, within the overall master plan. What do you think makes a good makes a good officer in, in regeneration in housing in planning? Oh well, that's such a good question. I mean again it, it's partly what I was saying about what makes a good a good partnership. It, it's very much about awareness uh, so for me, it, it's about looking at the, the big picture, looking at the context and asking the right questions and listening to what comes back and putting that picture together and then knowing where to act and knowing what to influence. Uh, and so a lot of that, you know, you learn through trial and error, you learn through mistakes. Um, but it's, it's getting that knowledge through talking to people who've done it before, talk, looking at what's happening in other places and seeing where those comparators really resonate with what's happening in the place you're working. Um, but yeah, I think for me, number one is, is that sense of commitment to the place. Um, so, you know, for me, I've worked in places for a long period of time. I've come in as a consultant interim manager over the last few years and, and worked for a much shorter period of time. But, I, but I've always got that sense of a commitment to the place because I think that's, you, you can't do the job otherwise. You have to understand what the place is about, what the community wants, needs, and commit to that, be part of that. So what was it in your in your upbringing, in your sort of, you know, your, your really early years as a, as, as a youngster, as a student and, and so on, that influenced uh, and shaped how you feel um, a good officer goes about their work and also your views on, on growth and development and what it's for and, and how to go about it? I'm not sure uh, that I've reflected enough about 
that far back uh, to answer that really convincingly. Um, when I was a student, I was in Brighton and um, I was living in the private rent sector as a lot of students were in Brighton, still are. Um, and I got, very, I got very involved in working with the student union to advise students who were having difficulties with their private landlords. So, I mean, that was really what led me into a career in, in local government and housing because I was, um, I was campaigning against Brighton Council <laughs> And um, and then I, I kind of penny dropped and I kind of realized, well, actually, if I was on the inside, I could change these these things that, that I thought weren't working for for people. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's where I ended up. But um, that's not really about growth. That's more more about how I got into into local government. That's interesting. I, I mean, you studied. It was it urban studies. What, what, I did. what were you reading? I did urban studies, which uh, it was one of those names of courses that, that you got in the 60s, which um, it, you wouldn't have it now because it doesn't really exist. Uh, I mean, the, the idea was that you could study the urban environment and all the players and all the processes and understand how uh, things, things work and change. But actually, when you, when you look at the, the literature on this, you'll find that urban sociology quite quite quickly got to the point of realizing that there wasn't an urban environment, there wasn't an urban set of processes that were distinct, and that it was all linked in with the wider, uh, you know, national political processes. And in fact, there's a theory that basically says we're all urban, whether you live in a village out in Sussex or you live in, in central London, um, this is an urban society. And, it, and it's, it's the way the society works. And, and all, if you look at all the things around supply chains and investment and, and everything uh, it, it's all based on that way of of seeing the world so how far back can you trace that interest i mean you, you were interested enough to to pick up on urban studies as a as a theme as a topic you wanted to get 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 um get further into to study at university so where, where did that interest come from so i mean the interesting thing would be from a very early age i was fascinated by maps and i used to i used to when I was doodling, drawing, I used to draw maps of imaginary places. So uh, that was that was one of the things I used to love doing. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I at one point, I remember probably probably 15, 16 years old, I said I said I wanted to be a town planner. Um, I, I don't I don't think I really knew what town planners did, but I liked the idea of that. Um, and when when games like Sim City came along, that was I just loved spending hours doing that. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it, it really goes back to those times. Um, yeah, well, let's let, let's um, let's just jump you back again to what we were talking about with with good development because I I kind of over I spoke over you and I think there were a couple of other examples that you wanted to to point out. So what other what other good developments would you highlight or, or developments that you're really proud of being part of? Well, I think I, I, there wasn't something else that I was going to mention specifically by name, but I think what I was going to mention was about um, the whole concept of sustainable development and, and green cities being something that, um, yeah, has, has influenced me from, from quite a way back. And, you know, now in terms of climate emergence and all of that, it, it, it seems even more pertinent and vital that, that that's how we look at things. So, yeah, when I was working in Greenwich uh, on Greenwich Millennium Village, um, I was lucky enough to go to a conference in Rome uh, all around uh, sustainable development with examples from all over Europe. And it, it was just so inspiring to see what was happening, whether it's Spain, Germany, Austria, other places. Um, and just that idea of what was possible from, from seeing some of those examples. Uh, and I can't name any of them to you now. I've forgotten the names of the places, but um, it, it was really, really inspiring. Uh, and then I and, you know, worked in Tower Hamlets where every development was a car free development. And yet the politics of that and the challenges around the, the, you know, the impact of that, not, not just in terms of, um, you know, community views on it, but things like how we rehouse people um, who are working um, and you know need a vehicle for for their job and things like that. All kinds of challenges around how you make that work uh, in a borough like that. 
um, and, and relatively easy in somewhere like Tower Hamlets where you can walk um, fairly quickly across the borough uh, and certainly get around by, by bus and tube. Um, and, you know, and more challenging to in, bring that thinking into a place like Redbridge where I am now. And, you know, I don't have a car. I want to get everywhere by public transport. I think that's the way to go. Um, and learning how that is and what that experience feels like uh, and, and, you know, very car dominated um, transport system. How far can we go in, in non-polluting mo- mobility systems and walking, cycling uh, and public transport in outer London boroughs compared to inner London boroughs? How much of a different problem is it that you're that you're facing there, Mark? See, it depends what you're focused on. So obviously there's the issue of air pollution and we want to stop pollution and therefore getting people into electric cars is better than having them in uh, cars that pollute. But there's still, the roads are still full of cars. Um, So getting getting rich people onto public transport is is by far the most important thing rather than getting poor people into cars, uh, whether they're electric cars or otherwise. That's, to me, that's not a sign of of good economic development. Um, But the challenge for me is looking at how do we structure the, the the development of the place so that it supports that kind of um, change in what, what they call modal shift yeah just you know change, changing the way you live your life so that you don't think oh I've got to have a car because I've got to take all this food round to my mate's house or, or go shopping and buy all this food um, which, which is probably what a lot of the journeys are locally you know they're little local journeys with people taking their shopping home or whatever uh, or going to visit somebody we've got to get to a point where people understand that all of those journeys are contributing to a problem for everybody, which you you can cycle, you can walk. um, There there are other ways of doing it. And, um, you know, people can um, start to see that if they experience it. But I I think it's, it's hard to tell people and show them without them experiencing it. And so I'm really interested in, I'm, I certainly haven't studied this any deep way, but I'm really interested in that whole behaviour change piece around modal shift. And, um, you know, if you look at what's happening now with, with fuel prices and you know, who knows where that's going to end up, but um, there comes a point where the fixed cost of running your own car and then the increasing cost of, of fueling it uh, just becomes ridiculous when when you look at what the alternatives are and I just want to get people ahead of that curve rather than it all being driven by money uh, it needs to be driven by social good and and health and and other much more positive factors active travel was the phrase I was looking for and, and yeah. the sort of positive spin that that, that has um, but so so you mentioned the kind of some of the um, some of the, the 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 kind of punishment end of the incentives, you know, the the higher cost of of, of um, motor vehicles and, and and gas and so on. Um, what about the, the the push factors from the the council? How much of a role can the local authority play in that behavioural change piece? Do you think what 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 is your role in terms of demanding that people change their behaviour? And and how passive are you in that in that and and waiting for other factors to to push people forward? How do you get people ahead of the curve, Mark? Well, exactly. If anyone knows the answer, let me know, because I don't think I, I am sitting here knowing the answer. But I, what I've got is the, the commitment to doing it. And um, I'm working with colleagues who are, who are working through some of those potentials. The one I talked about earlier, the community hubs. So rather than expecting everybody to come down to Wilford to talk to the council or talk to the job centre or the you know, whatever else it is, we should have a much better offer in each of the localities. That, that's the whole point of these community hubs. It's an integrated way of working so that people can come in the door and get the full range of services in one place. Um, you know, and, and I know lots of people have talked about one-stop shops before and, you know, there's all, all kinds of um, good and, and not so good examples of it. Um, but I really think it, if you think about it as linked to walking distance, travel arrangements, it, it does up, open up another perspective on it. 
And what about planning policy on on um, on car parking? Because in Wolf and Forest, they're requiring that any new development that comes forward, this is a neighbouring borough, I should I should say, um, any new development coming forward has to be car free. And is Redbridge going to go to a similar similar lengths? So I think the specific planning policy, we're at the stage where we're looking to review our local plan and update the policies and update the plan in coming years. Um, so from what I've said, you can tell I'm going to be very interested in, in promoting that kind of thinking. I can't make a commitment today that, that that's going to be uh, the same policy as Walton Forest, but uh, that, you know, that will definitely go through a consultation and uh, political approval process that that I don't control, but I will have influence over and, I, and you can hear how I'm going to speak to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the the car park thing is really interesting because um, when you look at Redbridge, for example, you've got people driving in from Essex to park uh, and get the train into London. Um, is it good for the local economy to have those traffic those vehicles coming into the borough is it good for local businesses is it good for local people is it good for the health of local children that's the kind of debate we need to be having um, because some of those car parks are, are, are certainly an opportunity to do something different fantastic thanks mark okay last part of uh, of our interview and my, my favorite part is uh, is to ask you what you do when you're not working um so what are your, your interests and hobbies that that kind of that maybe shape the way you view housing and development and growth? I'm not sure that any of my hobbies really shape the way I view housing development and growth, but uh, as I mentioned already, I do like to walk. Um, I, I love walking around, uh, looking at architecture and places and, and you know getting the feel of a place. I'd much rather walk around a place than, than uh, than be driven around it although you know both, both are good in terms of getting a sense of of a place um but i think um i'd much prefer to be up a mountain than uh in in the city to be really honest i i, I love to be out um so i mean i live in abbey wood which has the advantage of a, a elizabeth line station and an old ruined abbey and a massive wood it's a little bit of giveaway in the name there um and I love walking in the woods. I, I love watching the changing seasons and, and all of that. Um, yeah, I, I, I like to cycle, I like to canoe, a bit of climbing, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm also known for um, my interest in, what should we call it? Um, mindfulness and more what some people would call spiritual things. So I, I love yoga. Uh, I've done Tai Chi over the years. I've recently been learning about Tao Yin which uh, is uh, another Chinese-based uh, approach. And um, yeah, I mean, just um, to me, it's all about mind-body connection and awareness. So rather than just being uh, focused on thoughts, it's about being tuned into what's happening in your breathing, in your, your whole flow of, of body energy which is uh yeah what does Dao yin do that, that that tai chi and and yoga don't well that's a great question so the person who's teaching me would say that Dao yin is a, a principle that underpins both tai chi and yoga uh and the principle is all about it's what i've just been saying it's all about following the body's uh instinctive self-corrective flow so it's about um rather than following a, a set of particular moves or a particular um, way of doing something, it's about feeling into what your body needs and going with that. So you might, you might um, feel like you need to stretch your legs um, and you, you might sit down and stretch your legs and, and really stretch until you feel you've stretched enough and stretch in whatever direction you feel like. I mean, it's, it's, it's much more open and free flowing as a, as a way of, you, you go to a Tao Yin class, everyone's doing something different, but they're all following the same principle. How, what does that tell you about, the, and we were talking earlier about the public spaces and the parks in, in Redbridge, what, what does that tell you about 
the form that those should take and 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 how the the council should be shaping and, and nurturing those places in order to to help people uh with their well-being well certainly i think that um bringing different ways of working with people in terms of all these types of of what you might call body um health uh you know they're, they're not they're not set ways of of um working that all of all of those i think there should be a place for uh, and i think bringing that in is something I, i'd be really interested in exploring um but the other thing is just taking um public spaces and and using them to demonstrate these kinds of things. So when I when I lived in Brighton, um, I used to be part of a Tai Chi group, which every Sunday morning would do Tai Chi in the park. You, you know, you've seen the pictures of people doing it in China. It's happening every Sunday morning in Brighton. Um, that I think inspires people, excites people. And for those taking part, gives you a real sense of community and togetherness, which is which is really strong. Awesome, Mark. So, so given what we now know about you, about about your, your some some of your outlook on on life and and, and how to get through it, um, if, let's rewind slightly and and uh, going back to the beginning of your career. You know, if you hadn't gone into to housing and you hadn't gone into the public sector, where do you think in a, in a sort of sliding doors movie of of your life, where do you think you might have ended up? Well, I I nearly did a geography degree rather than the urban studies degree, and. Um, and you know, I was always more interested in the human geography end of things, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it's very hard to predict. I th I think I might have gone into uh, some something around um, you know mapping because, as I said, that was really interesting. I was really interested in 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 maps. Um, so if there was some kind of technical role around. Uh, mapping the world mapping areas and so on that might have that might have appealed to me um, probably it was planning actually isn't it it was probably yeah. that yeah yeah it was probably that you think the apple didn't fall far from the tree in in that sense no. um there was something else you said earlier that i was really interested in so so what you've said in, in terms of talking about what you do when you're not working it's it's so, it's fair to describe you as a bit of an explorer you know you like you like walking you like exploring internally spiritually as well as externally and 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 you, your love of maps all of that fits into a sort of consistent picture so as an explorer how do you feel about taking up a permanent role at redbridge given the the sort of interim nature of a lot of your roles in the past and also how important you said the commitment to places in in achieving good good development yeah i mean i think I've done seven years uh, as an interim uh, or, or, an, or a consultant and um, I loved it and, I, and it stretched me in all kinds of new ways and got loads of experiences from it. What it didn't give me was that sense of seeing something through to completion. I set up a lot of things and then left other people to finish them. Um, so the move back into a permanent role is, is about saying I want to stay in one place and commit to seeing this through. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how long that is, but, you know, it, it could easily be four or five years or, or longer. Um, but it's um, but it, it's still with a sense of exploration, I think. I think it's still with a sense of obviously it takes time to get to know a place. It takes time to explore what's possible in a place. And um, and then the, the art of delivery, I think, is still around. Uh, a sense of exploration of well, what comes next, and then what comes next, and then what comes next. So, it, uh, to me, it's all a bit of a journey, anyway. Well, on that note, it's perfect note to, to close on. Thank you very much indeed um, for being our um, vo uh, voice of authority uh, this week and taking part in our live interview. Viewers, um, thank you to the corporate director of regeneration and culture at Redbridge Council, Mark Bajent, and as. The virtual applause is uh, ringing out across uh, the Zoom community. Uh, I'll thank you viewers as well for sparing your time to tune in again and, and learn about the man helping to shape the vision uh, for Redbridge. Um, and just a moment to let you know, we've lined up a, a, a great autumn season of, of programmes for you beginning in September um, with uh, how modern methods of construction can support community land trust, uh, trust aspirations. Uh, and Mark's going to be 
back with us for that discussion along with a, a, a panel of guests. Um, and over summer, we've got a string of great interviews set up for you. We've got um, next week, the leader of Southwark Council, Councillor Kieran Williams, uh, on Tuesday at the slightly earlier time of 10 a.m. And over the next few weeks, we've lined up interviews with senior figures from Barnet and Westminster and other councils as well. So if you're doing business in any of those places, you want to register and watch in the chat now. But until uh, next Tuesday, from our voice of authority, Mark Bagent, from Carter Jonas, GLE and London Square Partners, uh, from me and from everyone at Three Fox. Good afternoon. <laughs>